The following program originally aired in July of 2010. Peter Marshall died suddenly on September 8th the same year. This was his last interview before his death. We are pleased to rebroadcast this program about such a remarkable man. Was our nation founded by Christians who came to this continent seeking a new opportunity to proclaim the gospel? Was our national government established on Christian principles? Do the American people have a distinctly Christian heritage, or is that a concept that's simply a modern-day myth? Stay tuned for an interview with one of Christendom's greatest authorities on the religious heritage of our nation. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end-time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. I cannot begin to tell you how delighted I am this week to have as my special guest the Reverend Peter Marshall, one of Christendom's greatest authorities on the religious heritage of our nation. Peter, welcome to Texas. Thank you, David. Good to be with you. Well, thank you. I, I uh, want you to tell our folks a little bit about uh, your ministry. Uh, I know it's located in Massachusetts, a long right. way from here. We appreciate you coming down. Tell us, uh, when was it founded? What was the uh, purpose of it? Uh, uh, where is it located specifically? Well, I was ordained as a Presbyterian minister in 1965, David, a long time ago now, and uh, served as an assistant pastor and then had my own church on Cape Cod till uh, the end of 1977, at which time I decided that the Lord wanted me to do full-time what I'd been doing part-time, which was traveling to respond to invitations from different churches across the country or uh, groups, cities to come and, and minister on growing in Jesus, uh, growing in discipleship, living the Christian life. But at the same, in that same year, The Light and the Glory, our first book was published on America's Christian heritage. And what's happened in the years since then is that the Lord has sort of changed my ministry into a national ministry of helping modern Americans recover the truth about this nation's Christian heritage and His hand in our history, specifically. So I still travel teaching and preaching wherever I'm invited to do that, often weekend conferences uh, on America's Christian heritage or sometimes Christian growth and discipleship, and do a lot of writing. been doing a lot of that <laughs> since uh, 1977 and well, plan on should. continuing that. <laughs> Folks, as uh, Peter said, uh, in 1977 his life was really changed by the publication of this book, A Seminal Study of the Christian Heritage of Our Nation. The book was entitled, The Light and the Glory. It traced the religious heritage of our nation from 1492 to 1793. And in the 30 years since that time, Reverend Marshall has published two sequels, bringing the history up to the year of 1860. He's now working on one that covers the Civil War. In 2009, a second edition of the original book was published. And in just a moment, we're going to interview him regarding this classic study of our nation's heritage. Peter, let's begin our discussion by talking about this great book of yours, The Light and the Glory. You first, the first edition of this came out over 30 years ago. What motivated you to write this book? Well, back in 1977, uh, 1975 actually when it started, David, it, it became obvious to me that America was starting to slide downhill. We were losing the moral and spiritual foundations of the nation, of the society. We were a society that was increasingly in trouble. We'd been through the Watergate crisis. You know, our institutions were, uh, were beginning to show signs of corruption. Um, the sexual revolution was in full bloom. I mean, things were not going well. And I began to feel that it was necessary to, I began to feel the Spirit of the Lord leading me to check into American history. I'd been a history major in college, but that was before I'd given my life to Jesus. Thought I'd never have anything to do with history anymore when I went into the ministry. <laughs> you know, I thought that was just part of my former life, you know. But had a great love of the history of this nation and, and wanted to see if I could find the evidence of God's hand in our American past. And that's what prompted the beginning of that book. Wow. Well, I tell you, it seems like we've been going downhill ever since then, but we're going to get into that yeah. more uh, next week. Let me just ask you this. You have just come out with a new edition of this book after 30 years. Why did you do that? Well, we found in, with the original book, David, we found overwhelming evidence of God's hand in our American past. I mean, far more 
than we could begin to put into, into one book. Uh, through the years since that book came out, oh, there were a few mistakes, some minor things that probably nobody but me would notice mm -hmm. but I, that I wanted to correct, but also wanted to add some new material. So there is new material in that. For people that love the first book, they'll love this new edition even more. There's new material on George Washington, on Samuel Adams, on the Lost Colony of Roanoke. Uh, I did a whole new appendix on the Christian faith of other founding fathers besides Washington uh, because I get so sick and tired of hearing this endlessly repeated mantra that the founding fathers were all a bunch of deists, which is flatly untrue. We'll deal with that well, later. Well, I can attest to the fact that you have a lot of new material in here because I've read both editions. And yeah. uh, you can see that uh, my edition is very <laughs> much marked up. <laughs> I, I just loved it. I couldn't put it down. Now, on page Thanks. 19 of this new edition, you say, our basic premise that is that God had a definite and discoverable plan for America. And it was confirmed many times over, albeit occasionally with surprising twists. Now, develop that for us, your basic premise. Well, the evidence shows, David, that the people, the original Christian settlers that came to this nation, particularly in New England with the Pilgrims and the Puritans, had a vision to put the gospel of Jesus Christ into practice in the new world, on a new continent, 3,000 miles away from anybody who could prevent them, and to create a society based on the biblical principles of self-government, that we govern ourselves first in obedience to God, and then we put Christ's second commandment into practice to love our neighbor as ourselves. Mm -hmm. That if, in other words, if people took the Bible seriously and put those biblical principles into practice, they could create a society that would have liberty and justice for every soul. That's the original founding vision for this nation. You know, uh, in modern times, that vision has fallen on hard times. Uh, you have the revisionist yeah, historians today, so. and one of the persons that they seem to have zeroed in on is Christopher Columbus, uh, the fellow who opened up uh, this part of the world to Europe. Uh, he was a hero in American history for many years, and uh, yet uh, today he is viewed as a villain, as a barbarian who's, uh, who should never have come yeah. here, and it was a tragic mistake that he ever did, and he was just a greedy guy who was looking for gold. What is the truth about Christopher Columbus? The man, interestingly enough, when you do the research on him, and, and David, what you've been expressing, of course, is the politically correct view of Columbus. Few people, very few people, that are committed to that kind of politically correct view ever have looked into the life of the man. They know nothing about him. It's simply a political, you know, project. But the truth is, when you do the research on him, what you find out is that he was not only a committed Christian, but he was a brilliant Bible scholar, able to read the Old Testament in Hebrew, the New Testament in Greek. He was a third, which, is, which was unusual for a clergyman, for a priest, pre-Reformation Europe, never mind a layman. He was a third order lay Franciscan, wore the brown Franciscan habit the last three years of his life. Actually, interestingly enough, was involved in a charismatic renewal movement <laughs> among the Franciscans. I know he was also a student of Bible prophecy. Uh, oh, yes. He was soaked in Bible prophecy. In fact, especially the books of Daniel, Isaiah, and Revelation. His book of prophecies, without being aware of which you can't understand the man, 84 pages in his own handwriting. The original is in the Cathedral Library in Seville in Spain. Wrote out in his own handwriting, most of it is biblical passages that he felt applied to him. For example, Isaiah 55, I think it is, where it says, the far distant isles oh. wait for my law. The well, didn't he actually write in his diary or log that he felt led of the Holy Spirit to come here? Well, in that book of prophecies, he says, one of his letters, he says, I could feel, he said, it was the Lord who put it into my mind. I could feel his hand upon me, the fact that it would be possible to sail from here, Europe, to the Indies. Then he said, all who heard of my project rejected it with laughter, ridiculing me, you know, which we learned in grade school. Here's the next sentence. There was no question the inspiration was from the Holy Spirit because he comforted me with rays of marvelous inspiration from the Holy Scriptures. I didn't learn that in grade school, and I don't think our <laughs> viewers either. did either. Yeah. I suspect that his strong Christian commitment may be one of the reasons he's being so severely attacked today oh, sure. in a society that's becoming increasingly secular. Yeah, absolutely. What he, he's become a political football uh, that's being kicked around by the, uh, the, North, the Native American and Indian lobbyists and so forth. I mean, he, he's become, uh, you know, the symbol, as you mentioned, sort of the, the, the poster boy for villainy, you know, for the European 
age of discovery in the Americas. He's, he gets blamed for everything. Most of the atrocities that took place in Latin America uh, were committed after he died. Right. Well, uh, another uh, thing that I found very interesting in your book uh, had to do with the pilgrims and their motivation for coming to yeah. this country. I was always taught, <clears throat> of course, they don't, you're not taught anything about the pilgrims today in uh, right. school, but when I was growing up, I was taught that they came to this country to escape uh, uh, religious persecution. Yeah, I was too. That was we their all motivation. were. But that wasn't their motivation. No. When, again, when you do the research, when you look into what these people say, what you find out is that they were missionaries. I mean, all you have to do is read the most famous quote from the pen of William Bradford, who was their great chronicler and governor, perennially re-elected governor. He said they had a great hope and an inward zeal, David, of advancing the cause of the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in those remote parts of the earth Yea, even though they should be but as stepping stones unto others for the performing of so great a work, close quote. So they're missionaries. They weren't running away from anything. <laughs> but coming in response to the call of Jesus on their lives, again, as I said earlier, to implement the gospel and create this just society. Because as, as adherents of the Reformed faith, the Calvinist wing of the Protestant Reformation, they understood that what Scripture teaches is that, is that we Christian believers are to take the gospel of Christ into every area of society, in whatever nation we find ourselves, wherever we're located. And that was a guiding principle all through the early history of this country. Wasn't Absolutely, it? that America was this, this miraculous new opportunity provided by God to Christian believers from, again, heirs of the English Protestant Reformation, to implement the gospel and create a society that would, that would really be a beacon of hope to the rest of the world, that human beings aren't doomed to have to live together raping and murdering and slaughtering one another, you know, that God has a better way. That's really why America was founded. Welcome back to my interview of the Reverend Peter Marshall, one of Christendom's greatest experts on the Christian heritage of our nation. Uh, Peter, I, uh, I want to talk a moment about the Founding Fathers. Uh, in recent years they've fallen on hard times. Uh, people <laughs> have attributed every vile motive to them that you can possibly imagine. And one of the things that the revisionist historians are really pounding on is that these men were not Orthodox Christians, that they were all deists. Now. Uh, Respond to that, but first of all, explain to us what a deist is, because many of our viewers may not know what that is. And well, then, were they deists? The closest modern equivalent would be a Unitarian. But bear in mind, uh, folks, that Unitarians back in the 18th century now were closer to Jesus, mm -hmm. closer to a belief in Jesus uh, than they are today. But uh, John Adams, for example, might be able to be legitimately characterized as, as a Unitarian, mm -hmm. you know, back in those days. But most of the founding fathers. David, the vast majority of them, probably well over 90% of the Founding Fathers, according to my research, were Christian believers. And, and we know that absolutely from their writings and speeches, oh, yeah. don't we? Well, here's an interesting little statistic. Of the 250, roughly, men who deserve the, the title Founding Father, 40 per, about 40% of them, David. Now, 40% of these men were not only members of various Bible societies in America, but office holders, 40%. Now, there, were, there, were, there was the American Bible Society, the national one. There were state Bible societies in the original colonies. There were city, Baltimore had a Bible society. And roughly two-fifths of the founding fathers were office holders. Now, you didn't become an office holder in a Bible society unless, number one, you revered the Bible as the Word of right. God, and number two, were committed to spreading it as the Word of God throughout American society. And that's, that's who these guys were. I mean, uh, Samuel Adams, for example, strong evangelical Christian. Even secular historians call him the father of the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. George, King George III referred to the revolution as Mr. Adams' war. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was personally held responsible for creating it. Strong, strong evangelical believer. What about a person like George Washington? Was he an Orthodox Christian? Washington definitely was an Orthodox Christian. Bottom line on Washington is he was a typical 18th century low church, meaning evangelical, low church Virginia Anglican. He was very, very reticent, very unwilling to talk about his personal belief, which is why he's, he's a difficult case for historians because it's not easy to pin him down. 
But if you look at the evidence for the man's Christian faith, it's overwhelming. He made over 200 separate biblical references in all his writings, David, over 200. 270 times he uses the word providence, divine providence. Now, this was not some vague sort of may the force be with you kind of thing. <laughs> okay. I mean, when he used the word providence, he meant he meant a heavenly father who personally is involved in his creation mm -hmm. and, and with his creatures. You know, because, and, and that's clearly demonstrated, for example, when he uses that phrase divine providence in a letter to the Hebrew congregation in Savannah, Georgia. He, what he says in that letter is, may that same divine providence who was with your forefathers mm -hmm. in the Red Sea crossing and performed the miracle of delivering them from slavery in Egypt be also with you and so forth. So he's referring to the biblical God who intervenes. One of the things that impressed me, I uh, ran across in your book, was that when he became the commanding general of the Revolutionary Forces, one of the very first orders he issued was... Yeah. To go to church. The general expects and requires that requires. All, all officers and men not engaged in actual duty shall attend divine services. <laughs> he also reminded them to bring their muskets to church with them just in case. Yeah, and, and he also <laughs> prohibited any uh, blasphemous language. Oh, he was he was death on swearing. He hated it. It was <laughs> it, one, one time his officers were dining with him in New York City before they evacuated that, and one of his the early in the war they didn't know him that well yet. One of the officers swore. <laughs> At the table, Washington loudly dropped his fork, on the and silence descended on the room. He looked around the room. He said one thing. He said, "I had supposed that all of us in this room were gentlemen." <laughs> that office. I bet things got very quiet. <laughs> oh boy, that officer. No officer ever again swore in his presence. It never happened. <clears throat> his men revered him because of his commitment to them and his obvious strong moral leadership. The modern revisionist historians uh, often just make a sweeping statement that all the founding fathers were deists, uh, and then they immediately go to Thomas Jefferson to prove it. And they say, you know, look at Thomas Jefferson. Here was a man who rewrote the New Testament, took out all the miracles, yeah. took out That's the true. resurrection. He true. was a rationalist. He was not an orthodox yeah. Christian. It's true. He was a rationalist. The thing is, Jefferson was an exception among the founding fathers. That's right. Fathers. Yes. See, and, and now Ben Franklin, again, Franklin's kind of on the fence there are quotes from Franklin that, that might lead you to think he was a Christian. Like when he insisted they start praying at the, uh, at the convention. Oh, yeah. He, Franklin was responsible. That, and the Holy Spirit has to have anointed those words. I mean, they're, they're really divinely inspired when you read that. Um, you know, the scriptures, the sacred writings tell us that not even a sparrow can fall to the ground without his notice. Then he says, can an empire arise without his aid? Yes. You know, I mean... So clearly, and that broke the deadlock, that and the July 4th, that was July 4th weekend, the anniversary thing, celebration for them in Philadelphia there, the delegates to the uh, Constitutional Convention, they went to church and heard a very strong message about God's hand in the revolution and so forth. <clears throat> when they came back, they reconvened, that deadlock was broken. Right. Yeah. I think Franklin had a key part you know, in breaking now, that. the Founding Fathers are often attacked as hypocrites because they talked about liberty and they talked about freedom, and yet some of yeah. them were slaveholders. Right. Samuel Johnson, <clears throat> excuse me, the great uh, British essayist, uh, Samuel Johnson said, uh, what is this yelping about freedom that I hear on the other side of the Atlantic yelping. from these slave drivers? You know, so there was some hypocrisy there. The Founding Fathers were well aware of that. And the New England delegates, particularly the Adams uh, from Massachusetts, you know, in New Hampshire and so forth, were absolutely determined to not have slavery, you know, in the new republic. The problem was that particularly, we write about this in our second book, From Sea to Shining Sea, particularly the South Carolina and Georgia delegates said, listen, we will never, our whole entire economy is based on slavery. We will never be able to get this constitution ratified. Mm -hmm. we, we, we won't be able to be part of the union unless there's some provision for slavery. So the compromise was the, the, the word slavery never appears in the Constitution. The slave trade, the importation of slaves was prohibited. 25 years, then it was done. Uh, they, they really hoped they'd put it, as Lincoln put it, put it on the road to extinction. Mm -hmm. They hoped that what would happen would be that the American people would, would get rid of it, which is why the word does not appear in the Constitution, because they were writing that document for all eternity. And they knew that. They're very conscious of the role they were playing on, on the stage of world history, David. And they were 
the northern delegates absolutely committed to getting rid of it, but the problem was they couldn't get the southern delegates to agree, so there had to be a compromise. This conflict in American history was not resolved until Appomattox. You know, it took a civil war because the church would not deal with it, but the founding fathers were well aware of that conflict and tried to get rid of it, but were not able to. Peter, as we pick up with our discussion, why don't we just take a moment to uh, pick up where you left off in talking about the founding fathers and uh, how many of them were true Orthodox Christians. You want to mention some other names? Well, Patrick Henry, I mean, good heavens, you, you, Patrick Henry was a strong evangelical Christian. It, uh, these guys, many of them, David, were not just Christian believers, but they were evangelicals in, in modern terminology. So they were interested in bringing people to Christ. Oh, yes, heavens, yes. Uh, uh, Roger Sherman of Connecticut wrote the creed for his local church in New Haven. He was, he was, a, he was a Calvinist theologian, loved to write theology tracts. Uh, I, I, in the new edition of The Light and the Glory that you mentioned earlier, I have an appendix in the back where I talk about the Christian faith of other founding fathers. I just randomly picked 15 or 16 of these guys. I mean, one of them was a, was a, a hymn composer. I mean, it, these guys... They preached. There are many, many, many sermons from founding fathers. They were busy preaching on Sunday mornings. So the argument that the founding fathers were not Orthodox Christians is simply a lie. It's ridiculous. Okay. I mean, it's simply flatly Let's shift untrue. gears here for a moment. Uh, in your book, uh, you constantly emphasize what you call the covenantal uh, basis of American society. Right. What, what do you mean by that concept? Why is it important and how does it relate to our Christian heritage? It's the most important element in American history. David, because the nation was founded by Christian men and women who were in covenant with God through faith in Jesus Christ. God is a covenant-making God. And what they believed, again, as Reformed Christians from the Calvinist wing of the Protestant Reformation, what they believed was that if they would build a society based on these biblical principles, in covenant with God, to seek to live in obedience to His commands and to put the love of Christ into practice, thereby creating a society with justice. I mean, if you don't care about your neighbor, there is no such thing as justice. So that if they would do that, that God would watch out for and protect this nation. And I think the history of America amply demonstrates that God has kept his end of the bargain. Now, would that be, for example, the basis of something like the Mayflower Pact? Absolutely. Yes. It opens the Mayflower Compact, which was this hastily uh, written out one page document creating a new government because the pilgrims were not, they were going to stay in Massachusetts. They felt led by the Lord to stay there, having planned to, been, to have been under the authority of the Jamestown colony mm -hmm. in Virginia. But the Lord had different plans for them. But they needed, because they weren't going to be under that authority, they had to set up new government. So the pilgrim elders gather in the captain's cabin, create this one page document. The first sentence says, In the name of God, amen. <laughs> well, see, I used to think, Oh, well, that's kind of boilerplate, piety, piastic talk, pietistic talk from, you know, the 1600. No, no, wrong. That, that was a formula. That was a specific formula that was used by Puritans whenever they created covenants or constitutions. And they did this continually, by the way. It was an announcement to the reader that what they were about to read was a covenant that had been entered into with God Almighty. In other words, what follows is based on our relationship with God. That's why they open it within the name of God. Amen. You know, there's a document that's been circulating on the Internet for some time now that's uh, very impressive to me because it uh, gives the opening uh, uh, paragraph of every state constitution. Mm -hmm. And yep. every one of them speaks <laughs> about a, a covenantal relationship, God. You and, bet. And all of them. Belief in the Holy Trinity. In fact, yes. In fact, you had, in order to vote in the, in the early years of the original 13 colonies, in most of them, you had to affirm publicly your belief in the Holy Trinity. But certainly to hold office, you had to do that. You also uh, emphasize in your writings that uh, the only legitimate government is one that's instituted by the consent of the governed. Yeah, that's, that is a, uh, the Lord showed me that American government, you see, in terms of giving our free consent, that's rooted in Scripture, David. You go back to Exodus 24 with the children of Israel in the Sinai wilderness. Moses reads the Ten Commandments, read the commandments of God to them. And then there's a ratification ceremony 
a covenant, a sealing into the covenant by blood, where Moses takes the blood of the sacrifice and he, and he says, okay, here's the word of God, the commandments of God. Do you accept this? The people say, yes, we will, we commit, we pledge to live by these commandments. Then Moses takes the blood of the lamb, it's sprinkled by the priests on the people. They're sealed into the covenant. Now at that moment when they've said, we will obey these laws, they are giving their consent to be governed by the word of God, the revealed word of God. So all true government, all righteous government is based on the consent of the governed because God governs us only by our consent. He's not a tyrant. He doesn't lord it over people. That's Satan's project. <laughs> all right. But God doesn't govern that way. So the point is, the relevance for today is any government which does not govern by the consent of the governed is ungodly government by definition. Oh. It's satanic government. So you're talking China, Cuba, you know, Sudan. I mean, there's lots of places in the world. One other quick point. We don't have much time left, but right. let me try to get this in. Uh, I've always believed that one of the fundamental differences between a liberal and a conservative is their view of the nature of man. Right. Uh, the liberal believes man is basically good and capable of perfection. Correct. Uh, the conservative says no, he is in, innately uh, evil right. uh, and fallen. Right. Uh, and uh, we must uh, face that reality. Now, right. our founding fathers faced that reality, didn't they? Because they were believers in the Word of God. They knew their Bibles. The Bible's clear about the fact that the nature of man is sinful and fallen. That's why we need a Savior. That's why Jesus had to come and die on Calvary's cross. And the point is they set up a government with checks and balances, a balance of power. They didn't even trust themselves. Right. No single human being could be entrusted with absolute authority because of that person's sinfulness. They'd use it wrongly sooner or later. That's why the Founding Fathers rejected monarchy. That's why America does not and have oligarchy. kings and queens. Right. Or oligarchy. So we have a system of checks and balances. Montesquieu of France whom they relied on a great deal, Christian, a Christian philosopher of civil government, may I point out, you know, he was well aware of the sinfulness of man, which is why he, he wrote about the balance of powers. And that is what they put into practice. Well, folks, I am delighted to announce that Reverend Marshall has agreed to come back next week. And at that time, the Lord willing, we will discuss the current challenge to our nation's Christian heritage and what we as Christians can do about it. Until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. What are the facts about our religious heritage and the faith of our founding fathers? Join Dr. David Reagan as he interviews the Reverend Peter Marshall in this three-part DVD, America's Christian Heritage. Peter Marshall shares more than 30 years of intense research into the original documents of the men and women who shaped America. In part one, Peter Marshall quotes the very words of the founding fathers revealing how ignorant we have become of our nation's Christian heritage. Part two is the discussion of the challenges facing that heritage. And as a special bonus, part three concludes with Peter Marshall sharing his personal Christian heritage with two remarkable parents, famous preacher Dr. Peter Marshall and popular author Catherine Marshall. America's Christian heritage can be yours for a gift of $12 or more plus shipping. Just call the number on the screen or visit our website. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus.